and they're looking for meaning and purpose, um, not that they don't have any, but more, you know, in the community. And I'm thinking of several that we've had, yes. and um, they can hardly wait to get their hands on the office. They don't want to be They come and go. Home. I do need more office yeah, care, we need especially a lot. now. I have to have and the... A lot of our volunteers say, I've had so much experience with death and dying. And you know they have an awful lot to bring to the table in terms of that. And they ask for what they want. Um, we have a lot of, some volunteers who prefer children. We have children. Um, we have some volunteers who um, love bedside care. Uh, we have volunteers who love to clean houses. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I would sign up for the cleaning of the house and the deaf and dying. I like to do both of those things. <laughs> yeah. So is this, this training isn't required to volunteer in the office? Yes, it is. Now and then yes, it is. Okay. It really so you, you understand. Sense. So it's you understand. The it gives you mm -hmm. a, then you're in a community, and we, you know, we embrace you. And yeah. Okay. Even the doctors have been through yeah. my training to get a handle on it, because it's so diverse. Yeah. Yes. How do, you, how, do the, how do the patients find you, and what are your criteria? Okay, um, the patients find me um, through word of mouth a lot. Uh, the hospital refer people, um, volunteers hear from relatives or families that I've nursed. I've nursed a, nursed a lot of families. Uh, they call the office. When you're out in the field, I give you my home phone number that you can call me. You're never without anybody that you can't call. The office, somebody isn't there all the time, so you have to leave a message. But if you're in the home, then you have my home phone number. And I wouldn't think twice about coming out to help in the night or anyway, anywhere. And I have a patient in Pewaukee that uh, his primary caregiver is his 16-year-old daughter. Uh, she was missing school. She's back in school. She sees a future for herself. She didn't see a future for herself before because she'd lost. Uh, she has no mother in the picture. She, um, her brother committed suicide a year ago. And here she is losing her father, who is only 50 years old. And uh, her grandmother, the, st the stability of the family, died two years ago. So she's seen a lot of loss. And she loves my <coughs> volunteers. She just loves them. And she's back in school, and she has a little job, and um, she's talking about a future. So that's the good parts. You, you know, know, a lot of this is also supporting the caregivers that are in the home of the patient. Not only you know, are you just sometimes merely sitting yeah. Open space for the patient, keeping them safe and hopefully happy. But really, the primary purpose can be also relieving the caregivers who are doing 24 7. If you look on Google, go into your fundamentals or master's text, I'm sure that they address the devastating effect long term care can be on the caregiver and how often the caregiver ends up dead, <coughs> totally physically compromised, spiritually or psychologically, versus the, they do a lot worse than the patient they're caring for. I was very lucky in a way. Um, I used volunteers for my son, but I always took part of the daytime, uh, um, you know, helping with the phys physical therapy. But at night, I didn't have anybody, and I had to turn in every two hours. And that was for four years. And I was younger then, so I had a lot of energy. But there were times when I longed to take a walk in the park. I used to just have maybe, if I was lucky, a half an hour or an hour outside the home. Um, of course, a lot of laughter went on inside the home, as you'll read in my book. And I'll tell you about one of the volunteers. There was a knock on the door one time. And there was this uh, biker with chains and spiky hair. And my other volunteer said, oh, you're not going to let him in, are you? And I said, yes, I am. 
yes, I am. I said I wouldn't turn anybody away. So um, he came in. He sat quietly in the chair. He watched, and he left after about two hours. And the rest of the volunteers said, oh, good, he's gone. That night, there was a knock on my door, and there was a bunch of flowers and an Indonesian meal and a Bruch violin concerto tape. It was, there were no CDs then. And I thought, oh, a Bruch violin concerto tape. Mm, and it was absolutely beautiful. And I didn't see him for two months. And he started coming every week. And he cleaned himself up. And just before I was leaving Australia, after two years, I got thrown out because Scott was well enough to travel then. Um, he said, do you know, he said, I was a dropout medical student. And he said, I'm going back to medical school. <laughs> yes, yes. And then I had a big ma uh, man come from the mountains. He knocked on the door. He was about six foot four, red beard, red hair. And uh, he had called me before and said, uh, his grandmother had taught him how to massage from working with uh, Sister Kinney in the polio days in Australia. So I said, oh, come on down then. Um, he came. I opened the door, had a big suitcase, a massage table. I said, well, what's in the suitcase? And he said, well, I've come for three weeks. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> And I only had two rooms. And he said, oh, yes. He said, the technique takes two times a day for three weeks. So I said, oh, OK, well, I only have two rooms. I'll sleep with Scott, who I was up all night with anyway, and you sleep on my bed. After about two weeks, he put a sheet up in my room. And he was massaging people in the neighborhood. The word got around. And he wasn't charging. And they would come in. And he did this three times over about a 15-month period. And as I was leaving Australia, he said, oh, thank you. I found my calling. He said, one of your volunteers has given me a little room, and I'm moving down from the mountains. And this is going to be my new uh, new career. And he was about 58 years old, and he was in heaven. So sometimes it teaches you not to, to listen to somebody first and not be afraid. You have to surrender. You have to surrender yourself also that you can't make someone's pain go away. You can't uh, cure them. You have to surrender, and you have to, to surrender to let people come in. And each one of you have different gifts. You don't have to be like this angel. You already are an angel by coming and wanting to do something, because there's always something to do. And uh, you know, when you surrender, I had to surrender to Scott. I could not take his pain away. I could help. I could make his life better, but I couldn't change it. And so know that, that you have to accept what is and help. And it's like in war. Soldiers, when they're together, I think that's why they make such bonds in war, because they're in it together. And the walls come tumbling down. It's like a real honesty. You tell someone in your honest state what you really like, what you don't like, what you need. I need arms around me. I need love. I need to be respected. All those things. It's really about honesty and surrendering. Yes. So do you have any more questions? <laughs>